Edwards, the coffee with the extra flavor lift, brings you Night Editor. <laughs> Night Editor, starring Hal Burdick and another of his famous yarns from Back of the Headlines. Tonight, a dramatic human interest story titled, Appointment with Mr. Big. Voices out in the hall, footsteps. All his fears of those long months as a war prisoner were crowding up into his throat, choking him, as he waited through an eternity for the door to open. It swung back, and there he stood. Captain Wade Vaughn was face to face with Mr. Big himself. Well, it's the dog watch on a big metropolitan daily paper. Last-minute stories about war, about peace, about love, about crime, and always about people are coming in over the news service wires from all parts of the world. Hal, the night editor, is sitting in his glass-paneled office, hunched over his phone. Yeah. All right, Wade. Ah, you betcha. And uh, be sure to look me up the next time you're in town. Maybe I can talk you into letting me write a story about that, huh? (laughs) Okay, fella. Goodbye. Oh, come on in, Bobby. Um, hey, what's that in the paper bag? I got Charlie down to the lunchroom to put our coffee in a pitcher and loan me a couple of cups. Oh. I was afraid you might not be able to get out later, Hal. <laughs> well, for that, you may go to the head of the class, son. Now, that's the brightest idea any young desk man around here's had in a blue moon. And it's your favorite, too, Hal. Edwards. And steaming hot. <laughs> Did you bring some for yourself, Bobby? You don't go right, I did. I brought mine back here to have it with you, if you don't mind. No. You said there might be a story in that long-distance call you were waiting for. Yeah. yeah. I just finished talking, Bobby. And there is a story in it. A great human interest yarn. I'll tell it to you. Captain Wade Vaughn is this chap's name. He just got back to this country today after three years as a Jap prisoner in the Philippines. As soon as he could, after he got off the transport, he caught a train for his old home city. And that's where the story begins. He chose a seat on the left side of the train. He had learned it was more comfortable that way. Then, too, if someone sat down beside him, he'd feel less embarrassed with the empty trouser leg next to the window side of the seat. Not that it mattered, but with the crutches propped up beside him, it was easy enough for anyone to see what was wrong. The army doctors told him it was foolish to be so sensitive about it. A man could let that sort of thing prey on his mind until it did things to him psychologically. Gave him complexes and fixations. And maybe they were right. Maybe he already had them. But not because he was self-conscious about the way people stared at him or tried to help him or asked questions. They meant only to be kind. He understood that. There was something else. Something that no one, the doctors included, knew anything about. It was the something that awaited him at the end of these last hours of the long trip home. The appointment, the interview that could make or break whatever of the future was in store for him. With the one job that would make the rest of his life a thing of happiness, in spite of everything that had happened. And it could end in bitterness. Complete frustration. His appointment with the person he called Mr. Big. Oh, that wasn't his real name, of course. Just Wade's private title for him, since their very first association before Wade went to war. But now it took on a new meaning. For today he was Mr. Big, the biggest factor in Wade's homecoming. As the train threaded its way through the yards toward the main line out of town, he settled back in the seat, a feeling of intense all-aloneness coming over him. That was part of the dread this appointment held for him, he thought, having to face it alone. No one to share the joy of it if it worked out. No one to offer the comfort he was going to need so desperately if it didn't. If Irene were there to see him through it, but she wasn't. Irene had died during those long months when no one knew what had happened to him. She wouldn't be there to greet him, to reassure him with her love, to help him see it through. Whatever was waiting for him was his to face. Alone. The panorama of the countryside was a blurred green backdrop against which remembrance played the scenes of all that had happened these past four years. His call to duty as a National Guard officer and the orders that sent him to the Philippines before this country got into the war, that last goodbye to Mr. Big and his own half-flippant bravado when he promised to get things straightened out in a hurry so he couldn't come back to his place as Mr. Big's top man. Those flame-seared days on Bataan that ended with his wound and capture. The long months of horror as a prisoner. Months when he'd been given up for dead. The final rescue and at last, the trip home. Irene's death had occurred during those years when he was given up for lost. 
He got the news of it a few days after his rescue. The shock of it, along with everything else that had happened, just about did for him. There wasn't much left him in life, except his place with Mr. Bake. And gradually, he began to wonder more and more about that. No one back home knew about the loss of his leg. And maybe, maybe that would make a lot of difference. The man who was coming home wouldn't be the man who went away. Wouldn't be the man everyone loved and respected for his strength, his ability to handle any task that was set for him, his fine, tall figure. No, no, there was something missing. Something that could make him a different person in their eyes. And mostly in the eyes of the one whose respect and confidence in him meant everything to him. Oh, Mr. Big would take him back, of course. He'd be generous. He'd try to overlook his shortcomings, his handicap. But if that was to be the way of it, he knew he couldn't take it. It had to be all or nothing. He could dodge the whole thing, of course. Not go back to the old hometown. Write Mr. Big a letter. Explain as best he could. Make other plans. But every time that thought came to him, he put it aside. He had to go back. He had to see it through. Irene would expect it of him. He couldn't let her down. And the more he thought of it, the sharper his awareness of himself became, the deeper his dread of that first meeting. He waited until the car was empty before he got off the train. Offers to help him now would only make him all the more conscious of himself. And the mental condition he was in, that might break down what little resolution he had left. In the depot, he sat down again for a moment. There still was a way out. He could telephone, explain about the leg, see what reaction he got. No, no, it had to be face to face. He had to see for himself. He left his bag in the check room. No use taking that with him to this appointment. Easier to get if things went badly and he wanted to catch the next train back to the city. He gave the cab driver directions to take him to the rambling old house set in spacious grounds out at the edge of town. That's where the appointment was to be kept. That's where Mr. Big would be waiting for him. As the car threaded familiar streets, something of hopefulness came back to him. In the excitement of coming back to scenes he knew so well, he forgot the other for a moment. And then, looking down, he saw the empty trouser leg, and the dread came back to him again with a hurt that made him press his lips against the sharp cry that rose in his throat. The cab stopped at the big gates in front of the house. He spoke to the driver as he climbed out, aware of his awkwardness. I, uh... I'd like to have you wait for me, uh, if you don't mind. Mind? Oh, why, sure, Captain, sure, glad to. Well, I know in these times when cabs are scarce, it's asking a lot, but I, uh, I may not be here long. Oh, long as you like. I guess you've earned the right to ask favors if you want to. Yeah, here, here, can I help you up the porch steps? No, no thanks. I do very well by myself. He hadn't meant to sound brusque. If the man only knew how little he wanted attention directed toward his disability in this moment, he'd understand... But he didn't, of course. No one other than Wade Vaughn himself could know that. Wade Vaughn, who used to be a man to help others. Wade Vaughn on his way to the most important moment of his life. He stood there on the porch several minutes before he could get up courage to ring the bell. Then the door was opening and a woman was smiling out at him. Housekeeper, perhaps. Someone of responsibility around the place for sure. Oh, <laughs> you're Captain Vaughn, aren't you? Yes. Come in, please. He stepped into the hall... From somewhere deep within the house, he could hear voices, laughter. He thought, how quickly that may change. I, uh, telephoned from the city, uh, made an appointment. Yes, I know. He's expecting you. I'll send him to you so you can be alone. He knew she was looking down at that vacant place on his left side. He could see the surprise in her face. Uh, don't mention that I, uh, I've been wounded, please. She nodded. Opened the door to a sort of office... If you wait in here, Captain, he'll be here in a moment. The door closed and he was alone. Well, this was it. And what a fool he'd been. What other reaction could Mr. Big have than one of shock, disappointment? At least it needn't take long. Voices out in the hall. All his fears of these past weeks were crowding up into his throat, choking him. As he waited through an eternity for the door to open. It swung back and there he stood. Mr. Big himself. Their eyes met through a long silence. Then the other eyes were taking him in with an almost studied survey. From the face thinned by those years of imprisonment, down over the body hanging grotesquely between the crutches, down to that empty trouser leg folded back and pinned for convenience. He had to force the words. Uh, <laughs> Hello, uh, Mr. Big. 
surprised to see me like this, I guess. I I didn't tell anyone. I thought it was best this way. Well, maybe... Uh, uh, his voice trailed a silence. That other pair of eyes were still looking down, rounding as they looked with wonderment. Well, he had his answer. Make it as short as he could and get out. He fumbled for something to say. Then the room was filled with a joyous cry, and Mr. Big was leaping toward him. The crutches flew out from under him. He staggered back against the desk under the impact. His whole world that he'd built on dread and fear and doubt was yanked from under him. And through the void into which he seemed to be falling, he heard, Oh, Dad! Dad, is it really you? My very own dad has come home to me to stay? He knew he was crying, too as he crushed the stout six-year-old body close to him, fighting with his own confusion to believe it was true. Well, I... I guess so. <laughs> yeah, I... I guess so. The stammered words came from nowhere. He forced the boy from him, lowered him to the floor. Only... Well, look, I... <laughs> I'm not quite the same, only... Sort of... Sort of half a father... My left leg. Well, you see, sure I see. And I want all the other kids here in school to see, too. I want them to see my dad, who's a real soldier, and, 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 and who's got more and, more and ribbons and medals and all that stuff to show for it. He really gave something to his country. He felt an exultation that lifted him to the skies, flowing through his fear-wracked body. Listen. Listen, boy. Do you mean that? Mean it? Oh, gee, of course I mean it. You wait right here. I want to bring them in now. I want them to see that... No, wait. There's something I want to say first. A new strength pulsed through his body as he lifted the boy to his arms again. I want to say... It's okay, Mr. Big. I'll take that job of being... your top man... Well, now that we've heard Hal's story, I'd like to have you hear another story about the extra flavor lift you'll enjoy when you discover delicious Edwards coffee. You'll like Edwards because it contains only the very finest Central and South American coffee beans. These choice coffees are specially blended in small batches by flavor instead of by weight under Mr. Dwight Edwards' own personal supervision. Yes, Mr. Edwards himself personally supervises the careful preparation of every pound of Edwards coffee you buy. But uh, back to the coffee itself. After the various types of coffee beans have been skillfully blended, they're thermal or roasted to the peak of perfection. To ensure absolute freshness, Edwards is ground for you right at the store. Try Edwards coffee. If you don't thoroughly enjoy its extra flavor lift, your money will be refunded. Get a pound tomorrow. Edwards Coffee is featured at all Safeway stores. Well, your story about Mr. Big was a great human interest yarn, Hal. Now, uh, what's ahead for us next week? Well, it brings back another old favorite of many a night editor yarn. Adrian P. Covington. Oh, oh boy, Adrian <laughs> P. Covington. <laughs> the one and only Jennifer County detective. That's right. Solving a crime, as always, with uh, <clears throat> one of those fool little clues... A story with some smiles and a surprise ending titled, Pass the Peanuts. <laughs> I'll be looking for you in the newsroom next week. Good night. Join us next week at this same time for another of Hal Burdick's stories from behind the headlines. This is Bill Baldwin saying good night for Edward's Coffee.